Welcome back. Today I'm here with David North. David is a thinker, a senior leadership and board advisor, global speaker, and best selling author. He's internationally recognized as the leading expert on strategic business relationships. The author of 10 books, including bestsellers Co Create and Relationship Economics, as well as the upcoming Curve Benders. Noor serves as a trusted advisor to global clients, coaches, corporate leaders, and rising entrepreneurs. He is an adjunct professor at the Bozuda Business School at Emory and Vanderbilt University owned graduate school of management. He was named to the top a global guru's top 30 leadership professionals list and is honored to be one of Marshall Goldsmith's top 100 global coaches. A Forbes leadership contributor on the future of work, Nora's unique insights have been featured in a variety of prominent publications, including the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Fast Company, Huffington Post Business, Entrepreneur, and Knowledge at Wharton. Born in Iran, Nora immigrated to the U.S. as a teenager with $100, limited family ties, and no fluency in English. He graduated from Georgia State University with a bachelor's degree in business management and went on to earn an executive MBA from Gozira Business School at Emory University. He resides in Atlanta, Georgia with his family. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us. Are you kidding? Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, After uh, that, that intro, I mean, I am too. I'm like, <laughs> who is this person? I was thinking of doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. You, you, you've done some amazing stuff and, and uh, gosh, 10 books. I. I didn't realize you had 10 books. That's awesome. Yeah, very kind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, you and I were talking a little bit about your research and the research that you've been doing since COVID-19, since this, you yeah. know, the world basically got turned upside down a month ago. Um, talk to me about what it means to be a value creator now. Sure. So uh, just a little context for your audience. I've spent, as you said, the last 20 years really, uh, Marie, being a, a student of business relationships, really understanding how they work, why they work, and more importantly, how do we put them to work uh, to do three things. My, my, my wheelhouse is driving profitable growth, sustaining a culture of innovation, and making real change last. Mm -hmm. And our supposition, our framework is that relationships can accelerate your ability to do that. Pretty much about a month ago when the global economy shut down, I would submit most organization strategies became obsolete because like a tsunami, the first shock was one of supply chain, right? As this mm -hmm. thing came out of China and we get a lot of our products and services and parts from China, Initially, it was, can we, what kind of disruption does this create to our supply chain? Right. As we start to feel that supply chain, and this thing now goes from China to Europe to US, and you start to see this incredible rise in number of cases. And, you know, we've had pandemics before, just there's a lot of uncertainty around this one. And the fatality of this and the fact that it attacks the elder population became a panic engine, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. So beyond the initial supply shock, the next one was a demand shock. So if I don't know what my customers are thinking, if I don't know what my customers are feeling, if I don't know what they're going to buy, when they're going to buy, how they're going to buy, if they're going to buy, mm -hmm. now I have no visibility on right, that income side of the formula. And if I don't know what my business is going to generate, I'm going to go on kind of cash hoarding lockdown mode, right? Yep. So it's cut back, you know, immediately cut unnecessary travel. So I started working with Delta Airlines in January, phenomenal people, unbelievably dedicated group of people. Their business literally overnight starts to do just this massive decline mm -hmm. because nobody wants to get on airplanes. Yep. Another former client of mine is Marriott. Again, same mm -hmm. concept. Nobody wants to go stay in a hotel, right? We were worried about the bed sheets to begin with. Now it's, it's, it's <laughs> even right. worse, right? So if I, don't, if, I can't, if I don't have a line of sight demand, then I'm going to really start to put the brakes on, right? So travel immediately got cut. Uh, contractors, any kind of uh, vendors, any project that wasn't mission critical got, got a stop on it. 
-hmm. And what happens is that whole economic engine of ours comes to, as everybody's experienced, into this massive stall, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not quite, it's not quite stopped because there's still some going on, but it's just we've taken the wind out of it, right? And everybody right. thought 2020 was going to be a phenomenal year. I've had 45 conversations with senior executives in the last three weeks, and, and they're all forecasting a really rough Q2. Right. And as I'll explain, a fundamental difference between a V-shaped recovery where it's a quarter or two mm -hmm. versus a prolonged U-shaped recovery that's a year mm -hmm. or two mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is how well can certain sectors keep this engine going, keep this economic output going, right? Sure. So big reason we all start working from home, you know, kids are home from school. And by the way, the other fascinating thing I'm noticing, the line between our professional roles and our personal obligations are getting blurred because with the kids at home, I'm suddenly a teacher, a disciplinarian, and a headmaster rolled into one. <laughs> I've also become the IT cable fiber Wi-Fi tech support. And I've become an experimental chef. Did you know there's 75 <laughs> different ways to make a hot dog? I mean, forget the fact that I've got to go on conference calls. I've got to, you know, you, thankfully our kids are older. Right, but if you're right. young kids at home, now you're worrying about, you know, and by the way, all the teachers and all the nurses should get an immediate pay raise because of this, right? God yep. bless them. Yep. So you started to see literally early on about a month ago, some sectors that are absolutely struggling, right? And again, I mentioned travel, tourism, right. aviation, maritime, automotive. Who's buying a new car these days, right? right. You don't need you it. Saw mm -hmm. the, you don't need it. You saw mm -hmm. Uber and Lyft. You saw if it's not um, uh, uh, essential construction or near finished construction, nobody's starting new construction. Real right. estate? Who's buying and selling homes? Mm -hmm. If you're not creating non-essential manufacturing, you know, financial services, like a lot of these sectors are in real trouble. Now, swing the pendulum the other way. Uh, education, right? All the education technologies in essence. Mm -hmm. Agriculture. Nobody wants to, you know, mess with our food supply. So agriculture, food processing, e-commerce, retail mm -hmm. is in trouble. But e-commerce has actually spiked. I don't know about your house. There's Amazon boxes in front of my house on a daily basis. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. I talked to a client who is in the technology infrastructure space, and they're, they're, they got a $5 million PO last week, right? Wow. So there are definitively some sectors that are doing well. Sure. And I would even say there's some companies within those sectors that are doing really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for your audience, um, my, my mother will attest to this ever since I can remember and she'll tell mm -hmm. you, I I've always been very, uh, very curious, mm -hmm. right? So I got curious about who are those companies that are thriving in the middle of the storm? Mm -hmm. Who's doing well? And, and why is it? Is it they're just lucky? Are they in the right place at the right time? And I don't believe... CO-19 has upended, I think it's accelerated some of this transition that was happening, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. retail is a good example, right? I, I wasn't that crazy about malls and every year our Christmas mm -hmm. numbers show more and more would rather buy online and with sure. free shipping and free sure. returns, right? So physical retail, it was, just, was declining anyway. This is now accelerated, number one. Right. Number two, a lot of those what was, a, what was a luxury a couple of weeks ago just became a necessity, right? So all those nice innovation initiatives and telemedicine and all those things that someday we would get to more of just became front and center mm -hmm. because it became absolutely a necessity in how to conduct commerce, how to take care of people, how to get things done. So with that curiosity, uh, we started to really think about uh, who within, I've always said, relationships are not between buildings or logos, they're between individuals. And that is just as true with leadership mm -hmm. and just as true with individual leaders who are running these organizations. So I started thinking about crisis and crisis leadership and more importantly, crisis resilience. And I started asking 
companies that are doing well, what companies are growing their business, right? Uh, and is it with the focus? Are they, innov you know, are they innovating? Are they managed well? And, and which companies are thriving in the middle of this, right? Right. And we started to uh, do some research, and I've got to give credit to two sources. So McKinsey came out uh, with an article, and if I could show, can I show, share my screen on this, on this yep, session? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So let me just show your audience. So this was the original article we started writing. By the way, just NOR Group, N-O-U-R Group.com. If you just go to our blog, you'll see this article, Value Creation in a Season of Crisis. Uh, so you could see we were, we were talking about it for a couple of weeks, and then we wrote this. I wrote this article on you know, March 19th, and I'm collaborating with two other Marshall Goldsmith uh, thinkers. Uh, Lou Carter is CEO of Best Practice Institute, and John uh, Baldoni is a mm -hmm. leadership coach. And uh, we started thinking about, uh, again, this idea of two critical questions and two uh, sources really stood out. So this is McKinsey. And they had an article, interestingly enough, back in 05, about asking, are you a value creator or value destroyer? And, and their lens was really looking at a uh, profitable growth area. They, they interviewed, they looked at economic performance of 3,000 uh, large uh, companies post-2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And they looked at what are these companies doing, right? What's, what's success? And what's fascinating is, again, they saw some of the same things, right? They saw uh, apparel retail. Uh, they saw food retail, internet retail, distributors. This is 2007 to 2011. Right. Look at the, the drag on department stores. Wow. Look at retail. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, food distributors. Yeah. So some, some sectors very consistently got hammered. Other ones did well, right? So it's interesting because in 2007, the, um, you know, the internet was not what it is today. That's exactly right, right? right? And look at how far we've come. Look at yeah. how much more capability and functionality mm -hmm. we have today. But even back then, the early part of it, those who adapted their business model right. to, and this is really what I want your audience to take away. They need to see the crisis as an impetus, as a springboard mm -hmm. to reimagine their business model, to re-energize, to innovate, to uh, really rethink their target audience. Yep. What are those mission critical needs of that target audience? And how do I repackage, reposition my value to meet them where they are and what they need? So you and I have been working together for a while. We, we kind of know each other. Think mm -hmm. of professional speakers. Yep. If nobody's having conferences, there's no stage, there's no right. audience, there's no, right. you're, not, you're not speaking. Mm -hmm. Even if you are a professional speaker, and you know my world, I speak 50, 60 times a year. Right. I'm already thinking, how do I pivot, not just in the short term, mm -hmm. but if more and more of these conferences and events go virtual, what's my value add? How do I engage? And you cannot take your existing keynote and pivot that and make that a virtual keynote. It's not going to work. Nobody's going to want to yeah. sit there mm -hmm. and listen to mm -hmm. a, 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 a mouthpiece. So what McKinsey here, and then another woman, this is a, a brilliant lady named Li, uh, mm -hmm. Eliza uh, Wiseman. She's written a book mm -hmm. called Multipliers. You know her. Oh, I love you know that her. book. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know her. You know her work. She talks about uh, this idea of multipliers, leaders, and those that are diminishers. So who raises the bar and the intelligence of their teams and who diminishes it? So based on those data points and based on some really interesting questions, we launched this site. And we're starting to, and I'll share this link with you and your audience that I would mm -hmm. love their participation. Absolutely. And we're asking questions like, how likely did you think a major event would occur that would disrupt your organization? Mm. Now, you know, I know in my sector and granted my sector is business. So, you know, online business, never, you know, my answer I, would absolutely be never. And a month ago I would have said, you know, or two months ago, if you would have talked to me and said, you know, 
in, in, in a month, everything's going to be disrupted. I was, I would have said you're lying. There's no and, way. And you bring you know. up a great point. You bring up a great point. So the smaller the business, the less likely to have a line of sight right. or a contingency plan right. for these kinds of things that they may not have not thought of pandemics, but you know what? None of us or very few of us thought of nine 11 terrorist right. attacks either. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of organizations I'm telling you went into 2020 in December thinking based on their pipeline, based on a roaring economy, it was sure. going to be the best year in their history, right? Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you did anticipate it, did you have a contingency continuity or emergency prep plan? Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of organizations didn't. Probably the not. bigger yep. they did, mm -hmm. right? They did. If you did on a scale of one to four, how confident were you in that plan? Right? Mm -hmm. Um, Probably not very, given not that very, most right? people didn't have one. And it was an afterthought. It was yeah. an afterthought, right, to most people. Uh, what role in your organization owned it? Who owns – is it risk? Is it compliance? Is mm -hmm. it, right, facility people? Is it – and, and the fascinating thing about what's happening, this isn't just one company or one geography. It is – this thing impacts everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and some people equate it to the war. Last time I checked, it was half the world fighting the other half of the world. Never in our history has been everybody's focused on a singular enemy. Right, right, right. right that right. we still, mm -hmm. you know, we don't understand. We don't have, a, we don't have an answer to. And mm -hmm. it impacts every facet of our lives. So this research is leading to coming full circle to our conversation around this idea of leaders or entrepreneurs or business owners who are value creators and value diminishers. So we started to capture some early research. Value diminishers, they fear. They're, 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 they're almost like they see the tsunami coming, but their feet isn't concrete, and they're either unwilling or unable to move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So they, they, they cut back, right, to avoid that risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Value creators see the risk, they're prudent about the risk, but they also see it as an opportunity to go after new market segments, create new products, create new services. Like I said, I get excited in working with leaders who are thinking about their portfolio approach, almost like venture capital sure, or private sure. equity. They're mm -hmm. thinking of a portfolio mm -hmm. approach yep. to business model innovation. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. I can't speak, can I do, I've created these learning sprints. Mm -hmm. If I can't, physically go see clients. How can we do whiteboards, digital whiteboards and do, and right. I've got a, um, I, I'm blessed. I have a creative director and I want to show you some examples of, right, we're creating, we're literally creating um, these, uh, we've had a service for a long time called strategy visualization where we go into companies and we create these elaborate illustrations of the strategy, right? Oh, so cool. this takes us mm -hmm. about 30 days and it's an iterative process and we work with them a couple of times. Look at this. We just launched something we call agile alignment. So what if I worked with those clients to quickly capture what their priorities are, what, you know, what they need to focus on, and how do they get their teams around a singular idea, right? So right. my point is, as you see the market demand, market need shifting, right? Being able to shift your services, being able to shift uh, kind of how you bring your value to the market is going to be critical in you remaining relevant. Right. Right. And this is an example. And this is, this is just, again, some things we're doing ourselves. Value diminishers. Focus on what's only and immediately right in front of them. Mm -hmm. Value creators look over the horizon to really start to get their finger on the pulse of what's going to be different. So again, for your audience, that. Yep. for your <laughs> audience, think about it a second, mm -hmm. even with a bio solution, let's say we had a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Number one, vaccines are going to take some time to roll out. Number two, any business that's predicated on physical proximity I think we're going to have an angst going back to movie theaters. Oh, absolutely. Sporting mm -hmm. events, mm -hmm. restaurants, bars, right? 
I, I don't know where you've been. I don't want to sit next to you. Good God. <laughs> middle seat, middle seat in an airplane. Right. Right. right? <laughs> so, right. So I think this is going to take us some time, even with a, even with a bio solution to kind of get back into what we do and how we do it. And everybody's talking a lot about this new normal, right? Right. So value creators are looking over the horizon on the other side of this and saying, okay, if I'm a restaurant, and, and again, I want to show you an example. If I'm a restaurant and people are not coming into my restaurant, what if we mm -hmm. converted our restaurant to a kitchen only? So if you could look at the screen yeah. with me, we take the space, the physical space. We don't need the seating. Let's repurpose the space. I don't want to lay off my staff because every business is, I've always believed your biggest asset is your people. Oh, absolutely. So what if we reskilled that wait staff, number two, to get better at logistics, delivery operations? Number three, we reconfigured our parking lot into a drive-thru. Number four, we took our best-selling on items on the menu and we created meal kits, right? Yeah. Number five, we created a, a, a membership online for our chef to teach people how to cook those meal kits. And number six, we changed our business hours or other ways to respond to a new need. For example, who's feeding quality meals to these healthcare heroes? Mm. So this is an example of the opportunities there for you to pivot. Value creators are looking at the horizon and really thinking about what do we have? What are our biggest assets? What are our capabilities? And how do we pivot? How do we start thinking very differently about what the other side of this storm is going to look like? And how do we plan for that now, invest in those things now? This is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and the restaurant, um, you know, right away. So the first part of it, right. That looks to me like what Grubhub's doing, what Uber Eats is doing, right. Well, what all these restaurants are doing and, and suddenly what we used to think of as a luxury, right. This goes back to what you were saying before, you know, takeout delivery used to be this thing that we did for a treat. It used to be the thing that we did when, when we were feeling lazy or, you know, whatever the case is now it's absolutely a necessity because you know, you can't cook 21 times a week sometimes. Right. So, right. right. And like so, I said, there's, there's 75 different ways to make a hot dog, but I'm sick yeah. of hot dogs. Right. What else? And it gets expensive right. to order in. So how do I, by the way, I need, uh, think about it. My entertainment options are limited with the kids. Right. right. So I, I'm a, I'm dating myself. Me and maybe some of your listeners used to take home economics in high school mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where, we where we learned how to cook and sew and do yeah. some of those things. A lot of our kids, you know, a lot of our kids are clueless when it comes to some of those things. What a fantastic opportunity to, and there's websites that are now catering to this through after school programs right. for the kids to keep busy. Let Learning mom how to dad, cook, yeah. Yes, let mom and dad kind of do their thing. What that restaurant, what if a chef or a sous chef or somebody in that restaurant was able to teach my kids how to saute and how to I chop mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how to help mom or dad. And so it doesn't just, you know, really, out, you know, we, we, well, we used to cook one or two meals. Now we're, you know, cooking 75 meals, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is an example of a restaurant rethinking. This is not about marketing. Mm -hmm. This is about you rethinking your value proposition very differently. Would, would one more example be interesting or useful? I love it. Go for it. So uh, I mentioned earlier our psyche and this idea mm -hmm. of what is it going to take for us to go back to work? So mm -hmm. we came up with this idea of facility health safety. So imagine us going back to a building or back to a, a facility where we got to be around other people, right? So number mm -hmm. one is access. So what if there was a health tent at the entrance and you were immediately, you know, temperature checked. And if you're sick, you're going back home. If you're healthy, you get to come, you know, to the building. And uh, we, we forget visitors. We don't need the lobby anymore. What if we turn that into this airlock entrance with UV lights that sanitized you as you came in? That's so on, cool. On your wearables. So uh, what if there was uh, not only an app that captured your core temp, but also did contact tracing in the facility, as well as what if there was an alert that if somebody was within six feet, it would alert you. Mm. Robots that are cleaning, constantly cleaning, sanitizing, instead of our hands on doors and knobs, what if there were motion sensors, right? Just like, and just like we've got sprinklers, what if there were sanitizing, 
right facilities and opportunities for that. And then we spread out our working space to give everybody that six foot bubble. And you also went through the airlock and got sanitized as you left. So now we're creating an environment where people can in fact feel safe, but they can also get back to work. So and they can, you, go ahead, sorry. This is an example of called, it's called systems thinking. It's actually been around yeah, for a long yeah. time, but it's really thinking not about a band-aid. This is not about a point solution. Right. Mm -hmm. It's really thinking holistically, how mm -hmm. do we keep our employees safe? and bringing them back to the office so we're productive. We'll bring them back to, maybe restaurants have less tables, maybe they have more you know, space that's spread out, but that alert on your device that says, hey, somebody's, within, somebody's invading your physical, personal space, I think would give people more of that comfort level that we can function, yet still keep a little bit of a distance. And it's interesting because this goes back to um, what you were saying about, you know, things that were luxuries, right? Motion centers, right? That, that used to be like the coolest thing in the store when, when you step on something or, you know, you move and, and the door opens, right? right. Or wearables, that's, that's necessary. If, if this is really in place, those things are necessary, you know, robots that clean, et cetera. And again, think about the market need. This virus yeah. is, this, this pandemic is dormant inside of us for, for a week or so before any symptoms, if at all shows up. But mm -hmm. again, if there's something is checking your core temp and checking, and again, I, I'm, I'm baffled by the dashboards in our cars. We know more about our cars than we do our bodies. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you're throughout the day, you come in, you're fine, you're safe, but middle of the day, you don't feel well. If we know that and we can do something about it immediately, now we can keep this from, again, spreading and creating issues all over the place. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is an example of, again, what we're calling value creators yep. versus value diminishers. Look over the horizon try to get your finger on the pulse of how will behaviors and mission critical needs change and how can you adapt your environment, your value, your ecosystem to the needs, the evolving needs of, of those ahead. I love um, it. This is great. I, I want to leave you and your audience uh, with a quote. And it's one of my favorites and I often use it in my keynotes. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write. It will be those who are unwilling or unable to learn, unlearn, and relearn. This is a phenomenal opportunity for all of us to mm -hmm. learn, unlearn, and relearn. The best clients I'm working with I have one CEO who has a standing 445 call with his leadership team every day. And Marie, he asks one question. What did we learn today? Mm. And they're quickly capturing those learnings. Each of those leaders have calls with their teams at five. They ask the same question. They share the same learnings. And their commitment, internal commitment is, let's apply tomorrow the things we'll we learned learn today. today. Yep, yep. Because that's where agility, agility and alignment is going to matter. That speed is going yeah. to matter more than ever before. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like if we're not doing that, we're done. You know, um, in, in this time, if we're not pivoting our services or creating new things or, or figuring out a way to exist in this new normal, and my our heart, business my, isn't going to exist anymore. My heart breaks for a lot of businesses that are not going to make it. And right. it's, 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 are they dealt a rough hand? Yeah. A, a restaurant business, like I said, travel, tourism. Yeah. By the same token. And I love this. There's an African proverb that says uh, the, best, the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago. Right. The next best opportunity is today. It's, it's now, yeah. Mm -hmm. What you can't expect is the shades from a tree you plant today but it's absolutely critical that, that you move. This is, this is the time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to move, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. If you wait for it to be perfect, what do startups say? Most startup founders say, if you're not embarrassed about putting your product or service out in the market, you've waited too long, <laughs> right? You're right, right. 
That's more, right. more entrepreneurs and business owners and business leaders need to accept and embrace that mindset that this is the time for us to pivot. This is the time for us to move and start planting some of these seeds now mm-hmm. because your market is going to demand right. that of you. I love it. That's such valuable advice. I think that you know what, what you're saying applies to everyone, um, whether... whether we're big, big business or small business, whether we're manufacturing or services or whatever the case is. Um, what's, what's your best advice for a small business owner that's, you know, maybe just got a laptop and is, you know, has been chugging along in this great economy for, for the past 10 years or however long and is now completely blindsided. What, what do you say to somebody like that? Yeah. Your biggest asset is your portfolio of relationships. Mm-hmm. So, uh, literally about a month ago, I started texting. I made a list of my top clients and I started texting them with, hey, thinking of you with the storm, uh, hope you and your family are safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me know of a good time for a 30 minute conversation to get caught up on both sides. Yeah. That was it. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't mm-hmm. sell anything. I wasn't, you know, there was no agenda other of course than not. Yeah. How, you, how you doing? Mm-hmm. And then, and then start asking, what are you seeing? What are you mm-hmm. doing? What's so a entrepreneur, a small business owner cannot go create a service in a cocoon and somehow magically things going to be successful. The best thing you can do right now is talk to, and I'm saying this respectfully, not your mother-in-law, yeah. Right. Not your cousins. <laughs> right. Not your, they're not your buyers. Mm-hmm. Right. Go talk, talk to, to your, your existing relationships. Mm-hmm. Go talk mm-hmm. to your exi- – it's also very difficult to prospect right now because nobody wants to talk to anybody that's selling anything, right? Right. So if you go talk to your existing relationships and simply ask, how you doing? What are you seeing? What's working? What's not working? Who's doing well? Who's – right? And, and understand, get your arms around what is it that they need you can start to then think about, okay, they have a need. They they haven't found a solution yet. Nobody's got a playbook for this, right? We're all making this stuff up as Mm -hmm. we go, right? Mm -hmm. Great. What can I do that would be of value to them? What Either what do I know? Who do I know? How can I add value? And I'm trying to tell you, those who get it will seek you out. Mm -hmm. So I've done probably 15 webinars mm-hmm. for clients in the last two weeks on digital etiquette. Smart. Very smart. 30, 45 Very minutes. Smart. Here's yep. some things to think about. Mm-hmm. Those are now turning into, they want more. Hey, could yep. you help us? with? So now that becomes a learning sprint, sure. which, and I've, and I've very politely asked those clients, you got any money to throw at it? Yeah, we could. How much? Is it my normal you know, speaking consulting fee? Probably not. But again, what you're doing is you're adding value, but you're also getting some value back from them, right? You're getting, you're getting some compensation back for it. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you build the next one. And mm-hmm. now it becomes, hey, um, could we do this for our clients? Yes. Right? Yeah. So yeah. It starts mm-hmm. to, you start to identify, what is it? Find a need, fill a need, right? Yeah, absolutely. So again, a long way answer to your short question of what should an entrepreneur with a laptop do? Get on the phone. This is not about emails. This is not about surveys. Yep. And you're going to come across as tone deaf if you go back to your automated marketing. Right. <laughs> this is about one-on-one conversations right. mm-hmm. with your relationships, with your customers, with your prospects. What do they need? How can you add value? Stop selling. How can you add value to that which they need? So I end every call with what can I do to help? Mm-hmm. And it's amazing mm-hmm. what people will tell you, right? Yeah. And sometimes, by the way, sometimes it has nothing to do with what I do with live, you know, for living. One client needs, you know, millions of dollars worth of uh, personal protection equipment, PPEs, mm-hmm. right, for healthcare. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not in that space. I don't sell N95 masks. I don't sell right. face shields. Right. But you know mm-hmm. what? We all have relationships. Mm-hmm. So I made five phone calls and we found somebody and we connected them to somebody yes. else. Awesome. And, and now the person is grateful because- And that I, person I, is going to remember you forever. You know, when this is all over, you know, you're, you're going to be remembered. 
Did I make a buck? No. Right. <laughs> but did I solve a problem and elevated myself, my brand, and my value with that relationship? You better believe it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if, you're, if your audience think in that way, how do, I, how do I look for opportunities to invest in those relationships? This thing, you know, today's cloudy, tomorrow's going to rain, but you know what? The day after that, sun will come back out. Yeah. And relationships will remember who invested in them mm -hmm. and who went dormant, you know, who took a vacation and completely checked out. Right. Right. I love it. That's really Good. sound advice. Everybody needs to, needs to watch this and everybody needs to listen to you. <laughs> was this I, helpful? Was this absolutely, useful? Absolutely. I absolutely. And, and I, I invite yeah. everybody to be thinking about how they can be, you know, val value creators as opposed to value diminishers. Cause it's easy to be, it's, e it's easy to be the latter, you know, it's, it's easy human to nature. just stand there. By, by the way, we're also getting, you know, barrage of 24 seven negative news that right. sucks the life out of you. Right. right. So I've stopped watching news, right. It just, yep. you know, <laughs> And, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, and people ask when people call and ask how you're doing, I'm like, is that a rhetorical question? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I'm really energized. I'm energized yeah. because of the research shows the four thinking leaders are thinking very differently about mm -hmm. value mm -hmm. creation and the evolution of their business, not just hunkering down and life sucks and I don't want to get out of bed. That's, that's encouraging. That's really encouraging because, you know, yeah. we need good leadership now. We really do. Absolutely. More yeah. than ever. More than ever. <laughs> so. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, best way is our website, just norgroup, N-O-U-R group.com. There's a blog. There's, we do, I've got, we've got four or five webinars coming up. We've got several online workshops coming up. I teach at Emory University and at Vanderbilt. We have a, uh, I have a course I'm teaching on strategy visualization at Vanderbilt. Uh, next week and there's still you can it's a virtual class so you can sign up there but yeah just our website is the best place to get ton of free resources download chapters of the books there's quizzes there's all kinds of stuff there awesome thank you so much for joining us today my pleasure i can't wait for the digital cocktail i want to have a regular <laughs> real cocktail ready for the happy hour actually it's funny that's that's somebody who has pivoted it really brilliantly um you're gonna love it because now he does virtual events I love and, it. And so he's co-hosting. How clever is that, right? We're going to have a dance party. It's going to be great. <laughs> you don't want to see me do a Elaine dance move. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too. Of course.